final, final talk of the workshop, Travis Metcalf on magnetic morphology. All right, everybody, final talk of the workshop. It's been a great week. And I hope to send you home, whether or either home or on uh, onward in the, in the longer term program with a few clues to think about um, and consider about a, a fundamental transition or shift in the nature of the dynamo around the Rossby number comparable to the sun. So I'm gonna give an overview of the latest observational evidence of the shift in rotational evolution that um, revealed this transition, the corresponding magnetic evolution that ultimately drives it. And then I'll finish by showing you the latest observational evidence uh, just from the last couple of years that really confirms this picture and provides some interesting clues uh, that I hope you'll be, will help you, uh, all of us, understand what is ultimately happening in the dynamo to produce this behavior. So as of, uh, so uh, Lauren gave a, a great overview of this technique of Zeeman Doppler imaging on Tuesday. I can't go into all the details, but she gave some of them. But as of 2008, um, this was the sort of data that we had for uh, stars like the sun at various ages. Um, so four stars here, we're looking at mean magnetic field strength on the left-hand side and the fraction of the magnetic energy that's in the poloidal component on the right side. And it's four solar analogs. We're using rotation period as a kind of a proxy for the stellar age. And so what do we see from the sample of, of, of solar type stars with a variety of ages? We see that the mean magnetic field strength decreases over time. That's, that's really the Skumanich uh, spin down law, right? That we've known for 50 years, but here are direct measurements of the large scale magnetic field. Uh, and then uh, maybe unexpected uh, result is that as the magnetic field strength is decaying, uh, more and more of the magnetic energy is being concentrated into the poloidal component of the field to the extent that by the age of 18 SCO, the well-known solar twin, it's just a bit younger than the sun, uh, you know, more than 99% of the energy is in the poloidal component. And when we saw this, uh, we basically took that to suggest that uh, differential rotation must be weakening because that's the mechanism or con converting the poidal field back into the toroidal component. So that's where we stood in, in 2008. And uh, shortly after that, NASA launched the Kepler mission. And the Kepler mission was designed to find uh, planets around other stars by looking for the small dips in light as they, some of them, pass in front of the host star. Uh, and, and to do that, it needed the photometric precision to basically see something the size of the earth pass over this something the size of the sun. Uh, and that's, that precision uh, offered two additional uh, capabilities. One, uh, you could measure the rotational modulation of tiny sunspots for stars that are even less active than the sun, very, very tiny sunspots. And as the spots rotate in, into and out of view, you get um, modulation in the light that you could measure with Kepler. So you could measure the rotation periods for stars that are older than the sun. The second thing, for a small fraction of the targets in the Kepler field, you would actually uh, monitor their brightness with a higher cadence than you needed for transit observations. And this was built into the mission because they wanted to do astroseismology of those stars because the transit method only tells you the size of the uh, planet relative to the star. And so astroseismology would give you the absolute size of the star and thus absolute size of the planet. But astroseismology also gives you the age of the star and the age of the planet. And so suddenly with Kepler, we were able to measure not only the rotation periods of old sun-like stars, but also their ages. When you combine those two things, we found something kind of surprising. So here I'm showing some of the Kepler stars and some other bright stars, rotation period uh, increasing downward, and astroseismic age along the bottom. And a standard like Skumanich-like spin-down relation would predict that stars follow this sort of, you know, as the 
the rotation period getting longer with age. And for the young stars in the Kepler field, they seem to obey this relation, but uh, at a certain point, uh, stars, all the older stars seem to be rotating more quickly than you would expect if this relation continued to apply after the age of the sun. Uh, and in fact, the turnoff for solar type stars was roughly around the age of the sun uh, and you know, happened earlier in hotter stars and a little bit later in some cooler stars that are not shown here. But the thing that they all have in common and the way that this was modeled is that uh, the deviation from the expected behavior, the expected spin down, kicked in at a critical value of the Rossby number in all of those stars. So you fit this behavior with a single parameter, the critical Rossby number. If you, once a star reaches that critical Rossby number, you just turn off magnetic braking and you have these modified models that then show the behavior uh, that that model produces. And so you basically, the rotation rate stays almost constant during the second half of the main sequence. Then it gets longer again as the star expands onto the subgiant branch, just from the change in the moment of inertia of the star, right? But magnetic braking is, uh, turns off. And that critical Rossby number turned out to be the Rossby number of the sun. Ooh, that's uncomfortable, right? But okay. Well, it's a small sample of stars, a couple dozen total in the, in the Kepler field where we could do this measurements of rotation and astroseismology. Uh, but that's where it stood in 2016. Now, since then, um, we applied the same basic idea to all the stars in the Kepler field for which we have less information, but rotation is, we are able to measure rotation, but we don't know the detailed ages or, or other properties. Now, if you forward model the Kepler field and ask if Skumanich spin down continues beyond the age of the sun, as we previously expected, um, you know, what would the population of stars in the Kepler field actually look like as a function of you know, rotation period, as a function of effective temperature or mass, right, equivalently. And that's the, the red series of red points here. The, uh, the color scale encodes the age, okay. Now the blue points here are the observed rotation periods in the Kepler field. And so what you see is for solar type stars, there's all these missing stars, right? So it's the same thing that we found in the smaller uh, sample that, uh, we don't find the long rotating solar type stars. They, they seem to stop before they get there. So either there's a detectability problem, there's a bias here where we just can't detect those long, even Kepler couldn't detect those long rotation periods. Or uh, if the weakened magnetic braking hypothesis is correct, then stars spin down until they reach this edge, which is sort of at, a, at the constant Rossby number. Uh, and then they just hang out there uh, until they move up. Uh, so some of these other stars are subgiants, right? So then they only reach those longer rotation periods once they expand onto the subgiant branch. Well, so recently there's been confirmation uh, that it is the latter, that the weakened magnetic breaking hypothesis um, does explain this. And, and the basis for that are two recent papers. One, ruling out the idea that it might be a detection bias. Now, if you use a completely independent method to measure the rotation periods, not photometry or not uh, rotational modulation of the sunspots, but instead rotational splitting of the astroseismic oscillation modes, like we do with helioseismology, um, that sample uh, has completely different detection biases and also populates the stars right along that edge, okay? So it's not detection bias. When you use something that has totally different biases, you reproduce the same result. And secondly, um, if stars hang out along this edge during the second half of their main sequence lifetimes, then you would expect along this edge to find stars with a wide range of ages. And if you uh, get better effective temperatures, more precise effective temperatures, so you sort of unblur this picture. In fact, you find, and combine them with Gaia parallaxes, so you can fit isochrones and get uh, at least somewhat reliable ages, you find along this edge, there is a population of stars with a broad range of ages, okay? 
So that pile up at the, at the long period edge seems to be confirmed. So in combination, these, these two recent results seem to confirm that stars stop spinning down during the second half of their main sequence lifetimes. Okay, now let's try to figure out why. The idea to explain why actually dates back to Derny and Latour in 1978, who basically suggested that if you want to sustain a magnetic dynamo, the Rossby number can't be too big. And there's, so the, from an observer's standpoint, the Rossby number is the ratio of the rotation period to the convective overturn time scale. Uh, and so there's two ways to make the Rossby number big. Now, Derny and Latour, they were motivated by the existence of the so-called craft break that was discovered in 1967. This idea that uh, if stars were too hot, F-type stars, uh, they simply never spun down, even from the, even in the early parts of the main sequence, right? So uh, the observation by, by Kraft was that at a, at a given mass, stars above that mass are all just rapidly rotating uh, at all points in their, in their main sequence lifetime. Whereas below that mass, you find uh, a decrease in the rotation rate as you peel off of the main sequence. Okay, so they were concerned with this limit when the, basically when the convective overturn time scale becomes too short, like in a very thin convection zone of a hot F-type star, um, then you basically lose the ability to, to generate a magnetic dynamo and you don't have the mechanism for spinning down the star from magnetic breaking. Okay, and the convective overturn time scale depends on like the 12th power of the mass or something. So this break is very, very sharp in mass. It's very easy to see. And so people saw it decades ago. The other limit is if the rotation period becomes too long and that's the weakened magnetic breaking limit, okay? Um, but the difference is that stars do spin down the first half of their main sequence lifetime. And to see the difference between a standard spin down prediction and a weakened magnetic breaking prediction, that difference accumulates over the second half of the main sequence. And in fact, it's maximum. So this is the fractional difference in the predicted rotation period from standard spin down compared to weakened magnetic breaking. And you see there's like a 50% difference once you get to the subgiant branch. So that's where it's maximum, accumulates over that second half of the main sequence lifetime. So basically, if you believe in the craft break, it's the same fundamental physics that drives the existence of weakened magnetic breaking. It's just the other limit of how you get a large Rossby number. Okay, so how does this manifest itself in, in proxies of magnetic activity. One of the curious things that stumped us for a little bit is that although there's this discontinuity in the rotation age relation, the activity age relation shows no such discontinuity, none at all. It's quite smooth. So in the background here are a sample of solar analogs. Uh, and so you're looking at a measure of the magnetic activity. So high activity up here, low activity here as a function of age. Uh, these ages are from isochrones. But it gives you an idea, you know, there's just this sort of little banana that's continuous. There's no, there's no turnoff or stalling at middle age. And that turns out to be true for some of these bright uh, test stars that we now have astroseismology for. They follow the same relation with some interesting scatter that is probably the mass dependence of this relation, okay? But when we thought about it for a while, we realized, you know, in the sun, the large scale field, like the dipole component of the sun's magnetic field is only about a gauss. Well, if you look at a little patch of quiet sun, it's more like 100, 200 gauss, right? And so if you lose the largest scale components of the magnetic field, that one gauss dipole, the rest of the field that's measured by a chromospheric activity measurement like log r prime hk, which integrates over all of those spatial scales, doesn't even notice, right? You could lose that 1% and you still have the 99% that's contained on smaller scales. So perfectly consistent, the activity age relation um, is not a problem. It doesn't need to be discontinuous. 
discontinuous and we wouldn't expect it to be. How about variability? What, what does that look like in a series of solar analogs? So these are time series observations over you know, 35 years, even more because they've been combined. So it's like 50 years uh, from the Mount Wilson survey in red and Lowell Observatory in blue. And these are a series of solar analogs. So when, when sun-like stars are young, they're you know, very active. They have a large amount of variability. It's complex variability because it's multi-periodic, just like often appears chaotic, but it's really, it's just multi-periodic and without centuries long uh, time series, it's hard to resolve. But as a star ages, a sun-like star ages, its mean activity level comes down. So, uh, the degree of variability comes down as well until by the age of the sun, it's really well-ordered, monoperiodic, shows these clean cycles. And then beyond the age of the sun, uh, eventually reaches uh, th these, this, the so-called flat activity state where either the cycle is too long or too low amplitude or absent entirely. We just can't see any variability. There's still magnetic activity you can measure in the calcium HK proxy, uh, but it's not variable anymore, at least on any, in it, with any precision that we can measure. Okay, so one thing I wanna point out is that this critical Rossby number is equivalent to a critical activity level. So for any given star, you can just predict what is the, the chromospheric S index from the Mount Wilson survey that corresponds to that critical Rossby number. For the sun, it turns out to be right here, just above the current solar minimum values, okay? So if you, what we think is that this represents the dividing line between cyclic activity above and no cycles down below. And as a star evolves through that activity level, you get some intermittency that can manifest itself in things like grand minima, right? Until eventually when it's entirely below that activity level, it just flatlines. Okay. I'll uh, come back and show you another example of a star that's entered a grand minimum towards the end. Okay, so how about activity cycles? This is a, a reproduction of a diagram that was originally published by Erica Bonvitens in 2007. She took the best activity cycles that were observed by the Mount Wilson survey uh, where rotation was also measured. And so she just plotted rotation period against cycle period. Uh, dynamo theorists seem to think those two things uh, should be related, right? And what she found was that there was not one relation, but actually two relations between these things. So there were two branches, this lower branch and this upper branch with the open points. I'll just kind of gloss over those because it's not important for the story. But interestingly, the sun's somewhere in between. It doesn't fall along either of the sequences that the stars fall. Well, we reinterpreted this diagram and also included some of these flat activity stars at the, stop, at the top. So you can still measure their activity. And so you can measure, in some cases, rotational modulation. So we know there are rota rotation periods, but their cycles are, you know, these are like lower limits. So their cycles are very long or, or absent. And you can connect these series of solar analogs to try to understand what a sun-like star would do, right? So as a star spins down early in the main sequence, its rotation period is getting slower, its cycle period is getting slightly longer until it reaches this critical Rossby number, then the rotation period stays basically constant. And what apparently happens is that the cycle grows longer and weaker before disappearing entirely. And we find examples of this among the hotter stars as well, and the cooler stars. Uh, and so that's the basic idea that, uh, that cycles grow longer and weaker on stellar evolutionary timescales, right? This is some several, million, uh, several billion years in the second half of the main sequence lifetime. Uh, and the sun in between, if that picture is correct, is on its way up. Its cycle should be getting longer over time uh, for the next couple billion years at least. Uh, and again, uh, here's another star that is kind of an outlier similar to the sun. And I'm gonna show, come back to that star at, at the end. It's an interesting one that's been in the news recently. 
Okay, but in the meantime, I'm going to show you uh, toward the end uh, new spectropolarimetric data where we directly measure the large scale magnetic fields in this pair of stars here, this pair of hot stars, and this evolutionary sequence of solar analogs to see what we can infer about their uh, angular momentum loss rates. Okay, but first let me just kind of summarize uh, the picture that we, the, the cartoon picture that we have for understanding what may be going on here. Okay, the basic idea is that slow rotation becomes non-differential, okay? People who do large-scale convection simulations will say, you know, if you slow rotation enough, eventually the differential rotation will flip to anti-solar. But we think that uh, the rotation, the critical Rossby number basically stops the rotational evolution before you get to that Rossby number where theoretically you could flip to an anti-solar differential rotation state. So instead, you're just weakening differential, the solar-like differential rotation until, um, until it stops influencing the, the convection so much. Uh, that loss of shear from the reduction in differential rotation basically disrupts uh, the, the omega effect and you, it prevents you from uh, converting your poloidal field into toroidal field, okay? And this sort of disrupts the whole dynamo loop in some ways, right? Because you remove the source or the alpha effect ultimately. The result of this is that the largest scale field uh, begins to weaken or disappear. And it is the largest scale field, the dipole in particular, that carries away most of the angular momentum from the magnetized stellar winds. Right, so the, the color scale here in the background uh, is a measure of the angular momentum content of the stellar wind with red colors representing lots of angular momentum loss. And the dipole field has an alphane radius, right? That's the radius out to which the uh, charged particles are sort of entrained in the magnetic field. And out at the alphane radius, they then shed the angular momentum. And so the bigger that lever arm, the more angular momentum you're, you're losing. And the dipole by itself carries about 80% of the angular momentum content of the stellar wind. So if you weaken or, or disrupt the dipole field, uh, you significantly weaken magnetic breaking. Okay, so that's the, the kind of cartoon picture that we have of what may be driving this whole, this whole picture. Okay, so uh, a few years ago, we went to test these ideas at the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. It's two eight meter mirrors with a brand new spectropolarimeter that Klaus Strassmeyer built in, in Potsdam. Uh, and we basically wanted to see, is there the, the prediction, the baseline prediction is that these young stars that are before the transition should show, uh, easily show large scale magnetic fields. But if you look at the older stars that are beyond the transition, you should be able to, uh, we don't expect to see the signature of a large scale field, right? Or we should be able to set limits on how strong it can be. So that's what we set out to do. And the first test was this pair of hot stars. So 88 Leo was that star on the bottom sequence of stellar activity cycles, normal star showing regular, regular cycles, young at, at 2.4 gig years. And sure enough, uh, we see the signature of a, of a large scale field. Just to emphasize here, the full scale here is plus or minus one part in 10,000 polarization, circular polarization across the spectral line. Uh, and so we modeled this profile, this Stokes V profile with a dipole field of strength about five Gauss. That's what you need to reproduce that profile. It's just a snapshot, it's not a full Zeeman Doppler map, but we do the same type of observations at even higher signal to noise, in fact, for the old star there. And statistically, it's a non-detection, but we can use that non-detection to set upper limits if you assume different uh, morphologies for the magnetic field. Uh, and so, you know, we can set an upper limit that the dipole can't be stronger than, than 0.7 Gauss. And um, if you combine this information with uh, estimates of the mass loss rate from X-ray fluxes and the fundamental properties from astroseismology, so the mass and the radius, and we know the rotation periods, 
you can use all those things together to predict the um, angular momentum loss rate or equivalently the wind breaking torque uh, of the two stars. And that, those are the quantities shown in green here. So from the between across this transition, across this magnetic transition, uh, the magnetic breaking torque decreases by at least an order of magnitude between these two stars. Whereas theoretical models would predict if you know if you continued standard schematics like spin down, you'd predict more like a factor of two or four. You know, so an order of magnitude uh, or more. Now again, uh, we just have these snapshot observations. And so, you know, it, uh, maybe we just caught a particularly inactive view of the star. And so we need full Zeeman Doppler maps, magnetic maps, to really put this on more secure footing. So that's the approach that we took for the solar type stars in the next experiment. And in fact, we were lucky that the two youngest stars are two that I showed you on the first slide. HD 76151 and 18SCO were among those targets that pre-Kepler had been completely mapped magnetically. So we know their full sort of magnetic geometries. Um, but the older stars, 16 sig A and B, had never been observed. They're old and nobody expected them to have very strong magnetic fields. And sure enough, uh, we went and looked and see these sort of upper limit null detections that we can use to set upper limits on the field strength. And once again, uh, I guess one of the surprises was that when you estimate the uh, windbreaking torque, you find that um, between the ages of HD 76151 and 18SCO, which remember is just slightly younger than the sun, you already see that more than order of magnitude reduction. Uh, and then that is maintained out to the age of 16 sig. It continues to decrease modestly by another 20% or so, despite the fact that the stars are expanding significantly um, during this phase. So, um, by, by the later phases, it's dominated by changes in the strength and morphology of the magnetic field. There's a big contribution from changes in the, in the mass loss rate in, in younger phases. It's more equal between the two. Um, but out here at old ages, it's definitely dominated by changes in the strength and morphology, which again are mostly morphology because the, as we saw, the aid activity doesn't change that much in the second half of the main sequence. Okay. So those are the hot stars and the solar analogs. This is one of the cooler stars in our sample that we haven't yet got Zeeman measurements for, uh, but it's been in the news recently because it is the first uh, star where we, we have, conf uh, have confirmed to see a star enter into a Maunder minimum. Uh, so these black data points are the Mount Wilson observations. During the Mount Wilson survey, it showed a very clear activity cycle of about 16 years up there. Uh, unfortunately, the Mount Wilson survey came to an end in 2003, but this star had been observed, started being observed uh, during the Mount Wilson survey by the, the Keck telescope, and those measurements have continued more or less to the present day. And you now see that those early data are consistent with the Mount Wilson measurements, uh, but uh, the star has kind of flatlined for the last 20 years. So in particular, this cluster of points here is where you would have expected the next maximum to be, and it's clearly not there. Um, this purple line, once again, is the activity level that corresponds to the critical Rossby number. So for this star, you know, it was spending about half of its time at an activity level below that critical value. Um, and so maybe uh, this is support for the idea that um, as you're evolving across this critical Rossby number or critical activity level, uh, the cycles can become intermittent, okay. Okay, and then finally, the final kind of piece of evidence that we found is from a study of a subgiant star that shows a cycle in the Mount Wilson survey and um, that we were able to do astroseismology with tests um, and try to basically um, we were motivated by the uh, rotation period of the star. It's much, much faster than you'd expect if a, subject, uh, if, it, if a standard spin down continued to operate throughout the second half of the main sequence lifetime, right? This is the kind of star that uh, probes the area of the HR diagram 
where you have the maximum difference between the predictions of standard spin down and weakened magnetic breaking. So, uh, you know, the measured rotation period of this star is uh, indicated by these dark uh, black lines there. And if you model, try to model all the properties of this star with a standard spin down, you get a, a rotation period of almost 80 days, whereas the weakened magnetic breaking uh, scenario can perfectly reproduce the observed rotation period. And, you know, it's almost a difference of almost a factor or two. Um, so that's curious. But the other thing is um, that it shows a cycle, like, and we wouldn't expect most subgiants to show a cycle. But if you look at the evolution of this uh, star, of a, the Rossby number with age of the best model for this star, right? So it uh, spins down during the first half of the main sequence lifetime, hits the critical Rossby number, and kind of stays there during the second half of the main sequence lifetime. But then as it expands onto the subgiant branch, it crosses that Rossby number, and the cycle presumably disappeared at that point. But then as it cooled and its convection zone got deeper, uh, it dipped back down below that critical Rossby number. And that's where we find the star today, right on the other side of that critical value. And so the idea is, yeah, if you're down here, you're, you're driving cycles. Um, but if you're up here, you're not. And only in the weakened magnetic breaking case can you ever cross and then cross again for these stars that are a little more massive than the sun. Uh, and if, a, if, if you did a standard spin down model would never reproduce that behavior. So we call this the, the born again dynamo scenario. And it's, I think, an important clue for what may be going on. Um, these stars. Okay, so let me uh, just summarize the four key pieces of evidence, the key clues uh, that will help guide our efforts to understand what is going on in the dynamo uh, that can explain the loss of all of these various clues. Okay, so first, the first thing that happens is that at a critical Rossby number comparable to the solar value, you lose the ability uh, or you severely inhibit the ability to, uh, to organize field on, large, on the largest scales, right? So that weakening of the dipole that effectively shuts, up, shuts down magnetic breaking. Once you're locked at that rotation period, so a constant rotation period, the cycle grows longer and weaker on stellar evolutionary timescales during the entire second half of the main sequence lifetime. And so at constant rotation period, right? So what's driving the magnetic evolution in that phase? It's the only thing available to you is basically the gradual change, decrease in temperature during, as the star expands and cools slightly on the main sequence. Um, so as they evolve through this critical activity level or Rossby number, um, you can get intermittency in the cycle that, that can produce grand minima. And we've seen our first evidence for that. And finally, uh, in the subgiant phase, uh, as the rotation slows further and the cycle disappears, after you deepen the convection zone, you can actually reinvigorate the dynamo if you cross back into the regime where uh, below the critical Rossby number once again. So I look forward to maybe having some conversations, but those of you who are staying on longer, I will unfortunately not be here, but I'd be happy to engage uh, remotely. Uh, to try to uh, piece through these clues and come up with a, a predictive theory, if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Shadris. Any questions? Thanks very much for that talk. I see the organizers save the best for the last. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a bit about it's just one parameter you've got there, the, the, the Rossby number. And I know this parameter has been around for a long, long time, and it seems to have survived uh, an amazing <laughs> extent of new observations. But is there really, how much evidence can you be certain that it's really just the Rossby number? But it is, there are extra additional parameters out there which 
make a difference. I mean, you had in you know, all your pictures, you had a very sharp divide as you cross that critical Rossby number thing. And I mean, it's hard for me to believe that there aren't other parameters which are making this thing <laughs> bend around. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The thing is that the Rossby number actually encompasses a lot of the parameters that you think might matter, like composition, for example, right? You'd think the, the metallicity would matter because it would change the depth of the convection zone and so the convective overturn time scale, but then the Rossby number already kind of encompasses that, right? Um, so, no, I think uh, so far at least there's no indication uh, beyond like the 10% level um, that, you know, so to the extent that we can measure the Rossby number in these other stars, uh, it really appears to be at a constant level. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, just a question. This Rossby number is based on the turbulent time scale or? It's the rotation period over the convective overturn time scale measured. Yeah. Uh, we tend to do it at the base of the convection zone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter. That's why I don't quote a number. I just say it's solar. So it's whatever you think the solar value is. That's it. Uh, yes, because continue what Chris said. Just, uh, of course, rotation is extreme. Or Rosby number is extremely important for the alpha effect. Uh, partially, it can describe also differential rotation, but only partially. We can say that if, if it's fast rotation or slow rotation. So for the alpha omega dynamo, it's important also differential rotation. Yeah. Yeah. So we think the differential rotation must get weaker, uh, just given the prevalence of poloidal field. Like almost all the field is poloidal in these old solar like stars. Um, and so, you know, if you had a very healthy, differential rotation that you wouldn't expect that to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering in the language of uh, Emmanuel, if, if the in intermittency in the Maunder minimum is a bit of a red herring, because if you if you think of the uh, like classical alpha omega or alpha squared omega type dynamos, if your delta omega over omega goes down, if your differential rotation switches off, you might switch from being a, an alpha squared omega dynamo to an alpha squared dynamo. And you expect the cycle period to get longer. You expect to go from um, periodic solutions to steady solutions. Whereas you kind of think uh, to get the kind of intermittency or chaotic, you, you might have to make the omega a bit bigger. So I'm just wondering if it's really, if it's if it's a, an integral part, the more than the minimum bit, or, or, or it, it could just be a, a transition from an alpha squared omega to a, an alpha squared type dynamo. Yeah, so I mean, in the sun, uh, after a grand minima, it somehow recovers, right? And so I, I don't know whether that represents um, a, a, a shifting from uh, one dynamo mechanism to another or an intermittency in a single dyna dynamo mechanism. Uh, I don't know uh, which is a better explanation for that. Um, I think the fact that we caught uh, a Mount Wilson star in the act of going into the into a Mondra minimum, and the fact that that particular star was spending the majority of its time, or at least half of its time, below this critical level. I mean, uh, that would suggest to me, um, you know, the the mean activity level of the cycle, like of the cyclic variation, um, when you're when the cycle is only sometimes below that critical level. You might expect the intermittency be intermittency to be a smaller fraction of the total time, like the sun is only like ten percent or less, right? Um, but as the evolution drives that mean activity level lower and lower, uh, one might expect that fraction to be greater and greater until eventually it's a hundred percent, and you just have a, a, a constant activity star. So that's my mental picture of of what may be going on there. 
and there could also be a switch in dyno, dynamo regime, um, but I don't, but I don't know. Um, not sure how we would test that, but we should think about it. Thanks. That was very interesting. Um, you just mentioned that you're measuring the convective time scale at the base of the convection zone. Um, if you measured it at the top of the convection zone, does that not change anything? I guess the question is, is the ratio of the of the convective time at the top versus bottom about equal for all the stars that you're looking at, or is there some trend there? Yeah, no. So yes, uh, uh, however you define, however, wherever you take your, your convective overturn time scale, it doesn't change the sequence, the evolutionary sequence. Yeah. So it won't change the ordering of, of the different stars that enter into the story, right? So uh, it changes the number or the scale, but it doesn't change the evolutionary picture. Yeah. I'm really puzzled by 18 SCO. <clears throat> so is your sort of hypothesis that <clears throat> it's basically not differentially rotating and therefore it has just a poloidal field that sits there not getting sheared out? Well, um, the Zeeman Doppler measurements that produce the magnetic field map that we relied on are actually able to test whether uh, whether there is significant differential rotation and they were unable to detect it in those maps right because mm -hmm. basically you're taking a series of snapshots in the stokes parameters mm -hmm. over a full rotation or multiple just a couple of rotations at most so you don't get too significant evolution right mm -hmm. um, and so you know you can do a cross correlation that assumes zero differential rotation or one that assumes that there is some differential rotation um, when you're reconstructing those maps. Uh, and when they, basically they found no significant differential rotation. Uh, but it, so it's small at least. But I'm just, I'm just trying to imagine how a star can just sit there with a convection zone and a, and a dipole. And is, is it, should I be thinking of this as a, as a dynamo still, or is this field just gradually decaying? Well, actually, if you look at the map for 18 SCO, it's, it's, it's actually dominated by a quadrupole. Um, the map was obtained near the cycle maximum. And so, you know, the sun shows that it's dominated by a quadrupole during maximum too. Uh, so, you know, we might want to get more, more maps of 18 SCO as it goes through its cycle. I think they, uh, this group also tried during the subsequent minimum and uh, just weren't able to detect it. We need bigger telescopes, uh, more sensitive instruments to make those measurements. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just hard to imagine a, a dynamo field that's purely poloidal. That's all. Yeah, well, 99% anyway. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I should qualify that though by saying we're only talking about the large scale field, right? Um, things above like, well, there you can see the, the maximum spherical degree is 10 in the reconstruction. Uh, and so, you know, all the small scale field, there's plenty of toroidal field there that just cancels out, right? So caveat. So apologies if the rest of you already understand this, but can you explain just concisely what allows the rotation rate to start slowing down again after that pause? What's the mechanism that you're, that's going on there? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about, yeah, here, this, this here. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, during the late phases of the uh, evolution on the main sequence, um, the star actually begins to expand yeah. and cool. And so it's just the change of the moment of inertia of the star that's driving that. So it's, it's a, a physical expansion. Yeah. Okay. Does this difference in um, rotation rate have any implications for mass loss that are interesting? Um, so the only place that we have looked at that question so far is between the two youngest stars here, uh, HD 76151 and 18 SCO. And so you can estimate the mass loss rates um, 
from the X-ray flexes, there's just an empirical relation for a small, you know, couple dozen stars where you can actually make direct measurements of the Lyman alpha lines. Um, and so if you, if you try to attribute the sources of the change in angular momentum loss rate, you find that, um, so that order of magnitude change between the two stars, you get about a factor of three from the change in the mass loss rate, another factor of three from the change in the strength and morphology of the magnetic field, and then another 10% from all the, all the rest. Um, so that factor of three is a bit bigger than um, what you'd expect theoretically just from standard rotational evolution models. It's more like a factor of two from all sources combined. Those, um, those models don't anticipate any change in geometry, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't account for the factor of three from strength and geometry. Uh, I guess part of it from the strength, but that's a minor component. So, so uh, there's tentative uh, evidence, I guess, that the mass loss rate may be changing more than you might expect, more than standard models expect. So it is part of the picture in the, in the young part of, the, of this sequence. In the old part, it's, it's completely insignificant. It's, it's completely dominated between four and seven billion years. Uh, it's completely dominated by changes in the strength and particularly the geometry of the magnetic field. So what, you've shown the chromospheric activity. What about the X-ray activity since you mentioned it? Because this is probably more sensitive to the global dynamo. Yeah, the, so this, the struggle here is that, um, you know, all of the young stars and up to the age of the sun have been well studied by all of these proxies. And uh, we are doing what we can to extend those studies to the old stars where that nobody thought would be interesting, right? <laughs> or measurable because they're, they're um, not strong emitters. Um, but we have looked at the available X-ray data. And uh, if you plot, you know, like X-ray luminosity versus rotation period, there is a discontinuity, uh, you know, that you'd expect because there's a dis discontinuity in the rotation period. But, but basically at that critical Rossby number, yes, you can, the old stars are systematically lower luminosities. And it's just a question of like, are they below expectations? And I couldn't tell you the answer to that yet. Okay, let's thank Travis again. Um, I guess that's it. All good things have to come to an end. So uh, I wish to thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank again the, the co-organizers. Uh, Joanne, Celine, David Gunn, and Uli. And I um, hope you have a safe trip back. And for those who stay, that we will have a good program. Cheers. Thank you.